Welcome back to the Mel K show. I am so excited. Everyone here probably knows my guest today. He is one of my favorite people and honestly, the smartest people I have ever met. And, and that's not just me blowing smoke. He t- I tell him every time I see him, but uh, I could not be more lucky than to have on Jason Burmis today. Uh, what we are going to talk about, it is coming from the one person who actually knows that they're talking <laughs> the whole story. Thank you for joining me, Jason Burmis. I would not say the one person. I think there's a lot of uh, great researchers out there. Uh, I would say, you know, obviously, uh, Whitney Webb has done some great stuff out there. I would say that Derek Rose has been on this case. Uh, And listen, Alex Jones uh, has also been on this case probably longer than most. And he really did afford me the opportunity literally all week uh, to come on, discuss what I thought was going to be in the documents. And now up until what has been released and they're still being released uh, moment by moment, day by day. I assume that they are going to maybe stop over the weekend and start again on Monday. And uh, we know that at least some of these documents are going to be withheld and continue to be redacted at least through one appeals process, uh, which is being revisited on the 22nd of this month. Well, I will say this because I, uh, I, this is for me personally, is that I watched you, go through these these legal proceedings, reading them on your show. This is how I personally learned a lot of stuff was from you and Sean Atwood. And I agree with Whitney Webb, of course, and her books. I recommend them to everyone uh, nonstop. But uh, you particularly put in a lot of effort. And then there's also something about you. You feel very compassionate and empathetic and and you really you knew you really delve into, you know, the real ramifications of this entire case and what it was really about, because a lot of people like the salacious stuff and you really got to, the you know, some of the victims you brought on stories of people that have been through this kind of hell. And so you brought a little humanity to it where I'm not seeing that much. So let's get into what's really going on here. What was released, what wasn't released and what your your thoughts are on, you know, where this is headed. Sure. So, so far uh, there has been almost no new names that I have seen that haven't been out since at least the uh, last dump of Epstein's Rolodex, uh, which that was when Noam Chomsky became a name. Right. All of a sudden, Marvin Minsky was out there. Now MIT was in that circle, but they'd already been mentioned uh, through some of the charities previously, along with Harvard University. Um, I would say that the, the biggest revelations out there uh, would be number one, and this is a revelation that's already being contested is that Bill Clinton personally went into the offices of Vanity Fair in New York and demanded that the 2003 story about Epstein not be run. Now, for people that are unfamiliar with that, again, a lot of this documentation had been released earlier. So we knew that there was indeed a story in 2003 that had information about Epstein and his abuse that they did not include that in the story. And instead it turned into a puff piece. Um, but Vicki Ward uh, was the author of this, and she had also come out and started to talk about it. Now, in the documents, it's now saying that Clinton himself tried to put that off. I want to put that in context for people, uh, because we often talk about the NYPD and the FBI knowing about Epstein all the way in the late 90s, according to Maria Farmer. And I would remind people her sister, Annie Farmer, recently won in court against some of the uh, banks that were sued for literally uh, hundreds of millions of dollars collectively by victims, giving a lot of validity to that story. Um, Farmer herself had said that she had done interviews with the media, including Vanity Fair, before this. And whether or not Clinton's involved, now people are getting the grasp. Wait, he hadn't been arrested yet in 2003. It didn't happen until 2006. So not only do we have the FBI... And the NYP, bare minimum, knowing on the record, we now have the mainstream media knowing on the record. And and this should show the compromise of all of these individuals. Um, Some of the other revelations that are out there. I mean, again, they're going for the lines on Bill Clinton and he likes them young. But really, there isn't a lot of a lot of meat on that bone because people are still focusing on the island only. Well, the Clinton's. I want to show people this. 
they actually had their own spot at Zorro Ranch, the establishment that was never investigated. So there was a, a a small village, a cowboy village, if you will, that was built for when the Clintons would come and visit. So we talk about Bill Clinton, we talk about the island, and we talk about the Lolita Express. You know, Eric Prince is the one that talked about Hillary Clinton and her relationship with Epstein and her being on that plane. Well, how about them being at Zorro Ranch, right. where he allegedly was going to try to run a baby making farm of up to 20 women impregnated at once? Uh, you know, I think I did your show this year just around the time that Bill Richardson had yes, passed. You did. He was a huge ally of Bill Clinton, had previously been named in these documents and of course was named again and he was the governor of new mexico at the time he is part of the clinton global initiative and the cfr and, and really when you talk about the clinton foundation into the clinton global initiative remember the documents that had already been out there and now they're being talked about again had epstein saying that what he had actually helped create the clinton global initiative and this isn't just him saying it to somebody. No, they put that into legal writing with right. his lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, and another attorney. So this is on the record, folks. These are the bigger things that people need to understand. This wasn't, hey, I'll call up Jeffrey Epstein and I'll buy a girl. No, this is a ring in which he's able to blackmail people. He's able to compromise big parts of industries we don't talk about, which is the arms industry. Right banking industries, uh, again, the trafficking industries, but also the drug indus industries as well as it, it's very apparent that he was part of the Iran Contra scandal. You know, that that was also alluded to by Vicki Ward. Right. So it's the intelligence assets that we need to focus on. And remember that raid in New York, I want to remind everybody that they entered this into evidence. That's why it says government exhibit 92-5-R with Ghislaine Maxwell. This is a black binder containing part of the extensive CD collection that we have no idea what's on these CDs. Oh, but we do. Because if you scroll down, you can see that some of these are named Selena AV shoot too. So I would imagine there's, I, I mean, my skills of deduction, they're not up there with some, but I would imagine that this was at least the second audio video shoot of Selena. And these are pictures and videos of that shoot. We never saw that evidence. Then you have the hard drives. Um, again, you look at this, this is even more perplexing yeah. because at one point, these hard drives had already been taken and had evidence tape on them. That means they were taken in some investigation we don't know about, returned back to Epstein. We still don't know the material that's on them or why they would have been returned under any circumstance. And then we have his safe with jewelry, with a passport that has his face on it, but another identity altogether and a Saudi Arabian address. You know, all this stuff screams of intelligence. And I do want to remind people, again, it's on the record. Anybody can read it. Um, he did cut a deal with the FBI. Right. We don't know who his FBI contact was. We don't know who it was approved by. We don't know who it was drafted by. And we don't know the basics of the beginning. But it says Epstein has also provided information to the FBI as agreed upon. Case uh, agent advised that no federal prosecution will occur in this matter as long as Epstein continues to uphold his agreement with the state of Florida. And remember, this was a non-prosecution agreement right. with not just him, with many. And I've been pointing out you want lists? We've got lists uh, right here. You can see uh, from his Rolodex that William Burns, who's the current CIA director, uh, was scheduled to meet with Epstein several times in 2014. So black book lists have been out there. The partial flight logs have been out there. 99% of the documentation you're seeing has been out there. I'm glad it's getting more traction and there's more details. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the latest Prince Andrew detail, uh, but that was slightly revised from before. What's um, the, what so, Did it drop today, new Prince Andrew stuff? So again, you know, the Rolling Stone, to their credit, at least they didn't put any of the Donald Trump stuff that had already been out there in here. The right. seven big relations in the Jeffrey Epstein docs. And again, these are continuing to drop throughout the day, uh, but they're talking about Prince Andrew and his puppet. Now, this is partially. Oh, right. I knew that story. Yeah. 
right. that, they, that Glenn Maxwell had actually bought this uh, almost life-size puppet that had been used on television shows. But what I didn't know is that basically they had Prince Andrew with one of their victims and another victim next to her, okay. his hand on one of their breasts, and then the puppet with a hand on one of their breasts and a picture together. Uh, again, someone has that picture, Mel. Right. I right. Don't believe Epstein just, ah, we're going to get rid of this one. Like someone has that picture. Right. Yeah. And again, um, when I in 1995, I actually came across him in New York City. So this has been going on at least since the mid 90s till he was arrested in 2017, 2016. So well, he was what, remember, he was arrested in 20, 2006 first. Right. Uh, quick. So and then uh, let's talk about that arrest just for a second, yeah, please. And, not only do you have the sweetheart deal, folks, but he only had to be in the prison from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day. And I'm he sure he, he wasn't. Uh, it's hard to believe that that even happened, honestly. I mean, but also to what, the other thing about the, the uh, Miami, I mean, the Palm Beach arrest, too, is that those cops. I mean, you've covered that. You covered that case a lot, too. There were cops and people that claimed to have evidence and tapes that like disappeared from the face of the earth, too. Wasn't there a guy that had to like flee to Russia? You know, I think that that uh, gentleman uh, was was not just trying to garner attention, but falsely saying he had taken tapes there. Maybe that was because he really did feel like his life was in danger. I will say this, Sarah Ronsom, and this is out in the public arena, uh, that is one of the victims yeah. that, again, these documents have been around for a long time. She claims that she watched some of these videos with Epstein, and she also makes the claim that some of these videos are in her possession for protection. Now, again, whether she's saying that to protect herself uh, is one thing, but I do believe her when she says she saw the videos, because again, when Maria Farmer initially brought this to the attention of the police and the FDNY, she said there was a room in the New York mansion that had basically been given to Epstein from Les Wexner, someone who never faced any kind of criminal retribution for this for either a dollar or $10. Right. And that station that was taping everybody was actually manned. And look, you go into the late 90s. Again, I'm a tech guy. I remember buying my first Maxter hard drive. Uh, this is what they used in those old school DVR systems, or it was really all, the only thing available. Sato still wasn't around at that point. Forget about USB hard drives and things like that. Folks, we had zip disks. Uh, they weren't even burning CDs at that point. Uh, so that tells me that in the late 90s, they were taking hard drives. They had video there. It was manned there. You would think the other establishments, whether it be Little St. James or uh, the New Mexico Ranch, had some level of surveillance as well. And in fact, one of the one of the revelations that has come out and that I had not seen before, uh, although it may have been published before, so don't quote me, but it's out there again. Epstein also trafficked Jane Doe number three for sexual purposes to many other powerful men, including numerous prominent American politicians, powerful business executives, foreign presidents, a well-known prime minister, and world leaders. Uh, Epstein required Jane Doe to describe the events that she had with these men so he could potentially blackmail them. Now, what's interesting to me about that is that is a key tool of blackmail because say that you didn't get it on video, but you did have information about that event that would be exclusive to the person that they did it with. Well, now you can show that person another piece of video that's totally different and maybe not incriminating and say, I don't just have this. I have this as well and compromise them that way. So there's a whole process to this yeah. uh, outside of just the surveillance. Yeah. And uh, I know from, I, I guess it was like fashion week in 1995 that I first heard about these model apartments because Epstein also owned a modeling agency and he would tell people, young women, uh, first of all, a lot of these models that lived in these model apartments were not at the time. Those of, it was the time of the supermodel. And these were not supermodel material, first of all. None of them spoke English. I had some a friend that lived in Manhattan next to a building that now I believe Epstein owned or was a part of that had eight girls living in a one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment from all over the world. So this, this trafficking, because you bring up John Luke Brunel, not many people know about him. He was married to Linda Evangelista, a, a major supermodel. 
um, and you bring up Les Wexner, this that modeling agency world, and it wasn't just women, it was men too. Abercrombie and Fitch is also one of his companies. They had uh, really infiltrated that modeling world as well, correct? Yeah, they absolutely had. You know, you mentioned uh, Les Wexner. You mentioned the modeling agencies and how they had them in small uh, apartments. One of the things that I played this week on Alex Jones was Claude Hadid and the 60 Minutes piece all the way back in the 80s. And the way that that worked was that they would go in there, they tell the parents, you know, how beautiful their kids were. They rile them up. You're going to come over. You're going to be on the catwalk as young as 15. So you had 15, 16, 17 year old girls. Now they would fleece them financially. They put them into a dormitory uh, style life. They would not have access to a phone most of the time. This is long before the time of cell phones. And they would take them to these events and dinners and basically pawn them off on different rich businessmen, politicians, you name it. Now, whether or not that was a, a honeypot operation, that was the norm for this type of behavior. You oh, look yeah. at, you said, Brunel, Jean-Luc Brunel on planes with Epstein. He was actually arrested and charged with multiple rapes. He was spending time in a prison in Spain just last year when he committed suicide and is no longer with us. Uh, Peter Nygaard ran a similar playbook. He had a Caribbean island. He was in the fashion industry and also um, forcing himself on women, not only women, but drugging and raping girls, allegedly as young as 14. His kick um, gets into this weird Epstein thing where Epstein starts talking about Island of Dr. Moreau with Steve Bannon and stuff. And the fact that he openly said, I want to live forever or I'm going to die trying. And he had biotech companies. But what he was doing with these victims is he was making them have abortions. And once they would have the abortions, though that aborted fetal tissue was converted into stem cells that he would inject in his own body in a quest to live longer or, again, live forever, like right. the, like seeking immortality. And then when you get to Epstein... And, you know, the Epstein clones or the baby making ranch, uh, we know that Steve Bannon is sitting on 15 to 18 hours of tapes with Epstein prior to his arrest, uh, right around that time period of the midterms. And he's released the Monsters trailer. And he says to Epstein verbatim, he says, you own an island. He says two islands. He goes, islands of Dr. Moreau. And he says, that's correct. Now. I have a sneaking suspicion that some of that tape is about to be released by Bannon, probably after this first dump is over, if I had had to guess. Now, that's speculation, but why am I making that speculation? I think it's an educated guess because Megyn Kelly is out there spouting her mouth off, saying that you're going to hear directly from Epstein soon. As far as I know, the only person that has direct videos of Epstein that would be addressing anything of significance out there is Steve Bannon. So we'll see. Time will tell. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, bringing up Megyn Kelly and her, you know, I can never, ever get over an interview with James Elephantis, uh personally. But um, what I do want to bring up is there's a lot of conflation um, between you know, now Pizzagate has been brought back into the forefront. Uh, obviously, it's all over the place. Pizzagate is not connected directly to Jeffrey Epstein, but people are acting like this is one in the same, and it's not, correct? It is not. Uh, however, what I will say about it in its connection is that uh, Pizzagate is most definitely connected with the, the D.C. sex ring, the one that was out via the Franklin scandal. If you talk to somebody like Nick Bryant uh, during the right. 80s, and 90s, you essentially had on the Republican side a lot of the time yep. uh, either sexual prostitution or pedophilia with young boys. Right. On the other spectrum, most of the Democrats uh, preferred young models or young girls. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Bernie Frank, didn't he have a, uh, a, a boyfriend that ran a, a ring out of his apartment in D.C.? And that was and then there was the other guy, Hastert, right? Givaderm is a luxurious, toxin-free skincare that actually works. Not only 
only do we take the toxins out, we put the most powerful nutrients in. All of our products are an effective way to detoxify, replenish, and protect your skin. Our toxin-free, natural ingredients provide real results without compromising your skin's health. Unlock the secret to beautiful, healthy skin using this synergistic skincare system. It's never too late or too early to begin living a more beautiful life with Give a Derm. Natural, healthy skin. Head over to the MelKShow.com partners page and get a 10% discount now. So Dennis Hassert, uh, I, you know, I haven't brought him up in a long time. Right. I'm sorry to mention that name because at the time, uh, again, when you look at the Republicans, yeah, all right. Arnie Frank was a Republican at the time. He had his um, male boyfriend, Frank Joby, as a paid assistant uh, for about, I think he was getting paid like 20 something thousand dollars. What was really going on was that they had a call boy ring operating out of his uh, apartment, I believe at the time, and this I don't want to be quoted on, but I believe at the time the consent age in DC was 15 years old. Okay. So people can think about that as they wish. Uh, that ring actually went out to, I believe it was the Chevy Chase Middle School, where the vice principal was also involved into that ring. Now, you get to Dennis Hassert, and this is somebody uh, that was labeled by a judge and never served time for this, everybody. I want to make sure everybody understands that and is out of jail right now, a serial child molester. And he was, at the time, the longest serving speaker of the house and not only that but the abuse went back decades to before he was even involved in politics and again let that sap on your brain yeah. he was a teacher a gym teacher and a wrestling coach and somehow in that time period after he had abused all these boys in that system i mean there are allegations of fourth and fifth graders i don't want to get too dark and deep into them but again no no criminal uh, um, charges ever brought for any of these things. The only way he was actually caught was through the IRS. Um, they were looking at his payments and he was paying off one of his victims. And when confronted, he didn't know what to do. So he basically lied about the reason that he was giving the money to them, saying he was blackmailed for something else. Finally, this individual that had cut this deal and really didn't want any public attention brought to him had to say, no, we cut this deal because he raped me as a kid. And it was in that exchange and the falsifying of that financial information that eventually put Hassert in jail uh, for fraudulent money laundering, I think. I think that's what he actually went to jail for. Wow. I think they, they got him for 15 months. I think he served 13. They portrayed him as an old man in a wheelchair. Uh, but it should be pointed out, you know, Hassert was a married guy, very, very straight, uh, but at the time was living with one of his political male assistants. And guess what? That assistant's brother had accused him of abusing him as a child. So all I'm going to say is um, some people take to the abuse. And, you know, that, that could bring us back to Epstein, because as I've often talked about, we already have names of associates. So I'm just going to show people uh, some of the faces and names of Ghislaine Maxwell's associates here. Sarah Kalin, Nadia Marsinkova, Leslie Groff, they're all out in the open. I am uh, somewhat sympathetic to uh, Nadia Marsinkova. Right. Tell the them why. Yeah. The documents reveal, and again, these documents uh, were out there that she was actually sold by her parents in Yugoslavia at the age of 15. Now, Marcinkova, who is now uh, Nadia Marcinko, uh, is a flight instructor. Uh, I'm not sure um, who she's married to, but a lot of these people get married off to very rich men. That is the case with Sarah Kalin. Right. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Kalin, she is accused of some of the most egregious things out there. Uh, again, Rolling Stone kind of behind the, the ball here. Uh, but one of the big things that they talked about here uh, at the end is that uh, here it is right here, stolen passports and kissing games. And they talk about this incident with Glenn and uh, Eva Dubin. Eva Dubin right. was said to be one of Epstein's former girlfriends. Well, how dark is that incident? Uh, it's about as dark as it gets. This is a 15 year old girl who woke up in New York. And the last thing she remembers was being held on the island. Uh, I'm just going to read 
this section right here, per the document, Rizzo testified through tears in his de deposition that he had once seen Maxwell bring a 15-year-old Swedish girl to Dubin's house while he was working there. A spokesperson for the Dubins denies the allegations in the unsealed filing. Um, the, the wife of the hedge fund billionaire Glenn Dubin and Swedish herself, uh, a former model and well-known doctor, supposedly dated Epstein, were marrying. Um, again, a lot of people got, you know, the after pickings of Epstein. Okay, I just want to put that out there. Rizzo's description of encountering the 15-year-old girl in Dubin's kitchen is disturbing. She had no passport or phone. He said she was crying and had no idea how she had gotten New York from the island, referring to Epstein's compound. Oh God. She oh. sat down and sat in the uh, stool uh, with no expression and with her head down. She was literally quivering. Now, if you read this, it was Sarah who took her passport and her phone and gave it to Ghislaine Maxwell. So a lot of people forget the fact that in that sweetheart deal, that non-prosecution agreement right. with Epstein, right. it also had other individuals, not just Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, but others that would not be prosecuted. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I tell people from my 20 years in Hollywood, when you think, uh, believe all women and the women are the good guys, uh, no, that is not true. There are many Ghislaine Maxwells and Sarah Callens in the world. And to, that this myth that they created with the Me Too, that that's not true, is not okay. And I hope these women do are held accountable. Now, I do want to talk about... Um, Something else that you know about, there was a guy, I think his name was Larry Nasser, and he was somebody that well, was very close to the Clintons, involved in the Clinton Foundation. I believe Jeffrey Epstein wrote him, was, was connected to him as well. He also was inserted into the Trump group and during, during the uh, apparently Russiagate stuff. And this guy is in prison right now, I believe, for trafficking a young child from Europe to the U.S. for a... a for pedophilia. And so like these people are out there that that guy is in jail, correct? Yeah, Nasser is in jail. And, and again, you know, labeled a serial abuser. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, this was the guy that they would bring Olympic athletes to. And remember, a lot of Olympic athletes are in their young teens. Uh, people forget that. Uh, in fact, a lot of people were really upset with, I believe her name is Simone Bales. Um, she was the oh, gymnast. Right. Yeah, pulled out at the last minute. Hey, guys, that was one of Nasser's victims. <laughs> if she wants to pull out of that thing, I'm 100 percent fine with that, because, again, the, the kind of trauma that comes with this, people really don't understand unless they've actually taken a part in it. And it is something that is life changing. Yeah. You know, you, you can talk about manslaughter, attempted murder and that type of stuff. You're more likely to get over a violent trauma than something that is continuously happening to you sexually, that even if you're not ashamed of it on the outside, subconsciously, you, you just don't know how to deal with it. A hundred percent. I mean, a hundred percent. And the other big thing, you know, I talked about it a lot in Hollywood, too, is that there's a lot of young boys that are victims in this, too, I believe, that are not coming out. People remember when Abercrombie and Finned and and you know in tandem with with Victoria's Secret, there's a lot of a lot of room there for all kinds of things. So people don't really get the the big picture a lot, and they're thinking it's like hot teenage girls, and that's not what we're talking about. And and that's kind of how I I didn't like uh, what James Patterson wrote um, that and then that that movie on Netflix. It was like such a whitewash of it. Filthy Rich, I think, was the the documentary, and they kind of wanted to paint the picture of what happened there, and it wasn't even. Even close to that. Um, now, again, um, I do want to uh, say that a lot of this is still coming out. And I think the one thing that you brought up and that I think people need to understand is we don't know which intelligence agencies for sure were involved, but there were many. And that and in multiple countries, you know, people bring up the Mossad, people bring up Saudi Arabia, people bring up the crown. Obviously, we have Andrew Ehud Barak, you know, regulars, Clinton regulars, all of that. I think the one thing that that people um, really should take, uh, uh, you know, seriously is that the, the blackmail for which he was running the ring, and I believe Maxwell's father was prior and she was, 
this a lot of this probably had a lot to do with decisions made by our governments, both here internationally in terms of war and policy, because the bigger picture of the blackmail ring that these people were running is that they were blackmailing worldwide decisions on a massive scale having to do with weapons and military industrial complex and drug running. And, and we don't know how was the CIA involved here. We don't know. But what we do know is that this was used to manipulate the world. And, and I think that people don't fully understand that this is a global mafia type organization that he was a part of. And he wasn't alone. And a lot of those people are probably still functioning right now. And that's where I think you know, because people say, so what's the end game here or, or, you know, whatever. I think the end game is finding that out. <laughs> well, I mean, what is the end game? I'd love to see some accountability, right? I'd love to see this network totally and completely dismantled. But what you just said is a hundred percent correct. I mean, let's look at Wexner for instance, and his interests outside of the modeling industry, because he was actually forced to resign from L Brands, Victoria's Secret, amongst the Epstein scandal all the way back in 2019. And when we talk about Brunel, again, he's in a grave and Nygaard, he's in a prison cell. So what makes this guy that much different? Well, Brunel was a pretty powerful guy. He liked to rock the IDF hats everywhere, but he wasn't very political. Wexner's extremely political. Um, and, you know, you could go back to his network all the way back to the Air America days right, exactly all the yep. wexner foundation and uh there's a famous document that leaked from the wexner foundation uh i think it's a frank luntz document he's the one that authored it but essentially um les wexner was heavy, heavily involved in what a lot of people would call zionist politics or whatever the pro-israeli politics are at the yeah. time and it was in israel's interest to keep the united states in the war of terror and uh, they felt there was a danger in losing steam in that after uh, shock and awe and getting Saddam Hussein in particular. So in this document, they devised several different ways to pull on the heartstrings of America and continue to try to convince them to stay in this war in the Middle East, including using fake pregnant women and tears and atrocities to do so. So Wexner himself is big time on the political spectrum. And a lot of the ways that the money laundering in this would work, other than the arms deals and the banks in particular, were these institutions. That's why the global uh, Clinton, or the Clinton Global Initiative is so important. That's why Epstein had charities in which he had cabins at, uh, you know, uh, institutes for girls. Yeah, That's camp. He at art Harvard. camp. <laughs> yes, the art camp. That's why he worked with MIT as well. And you look at MIT. Well, Noam Chomsky was one of those people that was elevated by the mainstream establishment as anti-establishment. What a joke. Uh, then you look at Marvin Minsky, you know, another one of these guys. Remember MIT? They worked with Boston Dynamics. They right. worked directly. Media Lab. Yeah. Um, you had Stephen Hawking, another person. Uh, that's now alleged to be in this underage orgy. Uh, again, Stephen Hawking, when he was around, he was kind of a womanizer, but then you wonder what exactly was going on there because the guy couldn't speak most of his life right. <laughs> through this. Yeah, um, and also so the Wexner thing that you bring up, up, so you got to remember something else got it got swept under the rug here, which are the Bronfmans, and uh, they were Nexium, which we can't say was not connected to this. But also, Wexner also has something like the Young Global Leaders at Harvard. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here with the periphery. Also, you bring up that um, Jeffrey Epstein says that he created the Clinton Global Initiative. There was a fourth guy that created the Clinton Global Initiative named Stephen Bing, who jumped off a building during COVID. Uh, one of the richest people in Hollywood and biggest producers also involved in, according to him, creating the Clinton Global Initiative. You know what I always found weird was that uh, Weinstein, who knew a lot, didn't flip on these people. Um, and I also felt that, um, and I wonder what you think of this, I thought that it was very weird that Maxwell didn't make a deal. Um, any thoughts on either of those two and, and why they, they possibly did not do that? I think starting with Maxwell, I think there's the hope that one day she is going to get out of jail and appeals. Yeah. 
Uh, I think that she looked at the limited scope of what they actually charged her with and the evidence that they did have. I mean, you look at those pictures, she knows damn well what's on those tapes. She knows damn well what's on those CDs. She knows damn well what's in those binders. Um, so so I think um, I think that she did cut a deal behind the scenes, uh, kind of like, hey, you'll probably end up doing five to 10 years here, but we're going to find a way for you to get out. And it kind of beats the alternative where uh, Jeffrey, you know, Tucker Carlson did a great interview with Mark Epstein yesterday, revealed more uh, about what happened with that second Epstein suicide that was successful. Uh, I mean, talk about more uh, egregious evidence that's over the top. So in that respect, I think that's the game that Maxwell's playing. Obviously, uh, her siblings are extremely powerful. Uh, some of them are involved in the World Economic Forum to this day. 